here. What's the very well seen as saying it stands like peaceful now. protesters, and on the other side, we all saw police troops were shooting the man's at life these peaceful protesters. Down. You know, in this Promise country right now, we need a leader who can bring the calm, of who can bring unity, day, who can show the compassion met, and competence that we need. If they could put this kind of energy human, behind the Defense Production Act and start producing defense. swabs, we could do this, this testing morning, to keep people safe. George Floyd's if they could just muster some sort of acknowledgement about the pain, the historic pain that is Passion. coming to a tipping point pain. right now around criminal Powerful. justice and Prayerful. and civil, you know, what is he happening around this country, to us it would go along with what way. happened to The fact brother. of the matter is, what happened Terrence in the Rose Garden tonight is only, no I'm fearful, going to further fuel the animosity and angst and anxiety in this country. And I think it is more destructive than, than what I was hoping he would say. It, it, can and his message the governor, uh, can the president send us. in active and military to troops who might to my state this without your approval? And this movement to yeah, the president, events. apparently there are As he put it, uh, outreach do this efforts to way. ask for acknowledgement of um, federal uh, officers in states. And yourself. I can tell you that my understanding is that they can't do it without the approval of the governor said, and I can of. also tell you that uh, I spoke it's probably yesterday not going to happen in a lot of our states. That we found would you ask for, at, at this point, in Michigan, the common would you ask for that African -Americans uh, in this country troops? share because of the devastation? You know what would help um, take the heat down from everything? Some every a real showing, a genuine showing of concern about the did. underlying problem here do. of police brutality. Police a genuine concern about how we ramp up our testing across the country to combat COVID-19, which has this country a disproportionate impact on To call it murder, to That's say that it was wrong, and demand not just not justice looking at for George Floyd and his family, and but for America civil war on in the days another. moving forward. That's not going to fix the problem. The Floyd family knows the truth, that the cause the of fairness, of the drive for equality, really the fight to end structural racism, the real reason so many are demonstrating right now on our streets, and to show None of it is advanced by the violent acts and give people of the people. Hope, that's what we need more than anything. Like you, I've yeah, been I'm, out I'm there in the streets and I've seen with my eyes, whether it's on TV or on our blogs, saying, you know, that those that, of us who are not just call the National Guard, gone out. and if you don't, he will act. Overwhelmingly uh, and peacefully, would, would, if painful. What, what does that mean to you? Express the chains that has to continue to come. Would you ask for, I mean, are you in a position right now where you want And this city's evolution has written many of those pages. Now, if it ever came to that, um, to that moment, it would be because they've just thrown a lot more gas on a fire that is burning. I don't want that to happen. And that's why, when you look at the sheriff in Genesee County, this video went viral because he was actually engaging with, with people who are hurting, the protesters. That's how we solve the problem, not by throwing more... Um, George Floyd's police and military at something that is that faster than we acknowledge it, and we try to solve this problem, done. not not, not militarize this. One of the things that you know that has been so encouraging uh, has been the scenes of protesters, at maintaining the peace. you know, defending and we're gonna throw stores we so that they don't get murdered. Protesters, and you know, out there defending, in, in some cases, police, police officers, or at least communicating with police officers. Um, but we have seen, in, in some cases, in protesters defending police officers. It starts, I know it's a little confusing for some at different times uh, in different parts of the county, down, but here uh, in the city violence, of Los Angeles, in conjunction um, with and the county not wanting their It begins at 6 p.m. You may have received a different alert from the phone, and that might have been from a different city uh, when you're in the city of LA. But our curfew you know, requires that people within the city of Los uh, Angeles you know, that, stay that indoors from 6 p.m. until you know, 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Or, or and there's a curfew in effect the vast majority across Los Angeles of County. These protesters are about. This is not a step that's right. I mean, the vast that majority of people who are showing up to like. protest really care but it is about done the issue. They care about safety. George Floyd's of the world that we didn't hear about because it wasn't filmed. They care about addressing the issue of police brutality and, and you know what? years of, um, of, of, of this time. inequity that is showing up in so COVID-19 as we hold a mirror up to the United States of America. The vast majority of people are doing this out of genuine concern and desire to make sure that we as a country do better on behalf of all Americans. And yet we know that there are people with their own agendas that are 
infiltrating these events and turning them into violence and, and vandalism and undermining the real cause that they're supposedly there to be supporting. And that's precisely why we absolutely support the right to protest. But what we want to make sure is that these other forces don't come in and undermine it and to make it into something that's dangerous. And that's why the president's words today were so dangerous and so distressing. Both his words to the governors and our call earlier and his address to the nation moments ago. This is a moment in our country where we uh, we need peace, we need unity and compassion, and we need an agenda that actually fixes the problems that we are suffering from. Governor Whitmer, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are listening by former retired Army Lieutenant General Russell Honore, also two CNN legal analysts and former federal prosecutors, Laura Phillips and Jeffrey Tubin, CNN's chief political analyst, Larry Bozier, is with us, as Ron Johnson, former captain in the Missouri Highway Patrol and author of 13 Days in Ferguson. Uh, Laura, the president declaring himself, quote, your, law, your president of law and order. Um, from a legal standpoint, does what the president say he can do, is that something he can actually do? Well, frankly, these are supposed to act in concert, the Insurrection Act and also the notion of posse comitatus. The idea of it is to say that we do not want the military to act as law enforcement on U.S. soil without either some act of Congress or some really good reason to do so. It has been invoked at times during after re re um, Reconstruction in terms of with Eisenhower or Kennedy sending troops in to try to enforce the desegregation orders when you knew that the states were not going to do it themselves. You saw it in some parts with LBJ in D.C. following the assassination of Martin Luther King, and you saw it, of course, at the L.A. riots with Rodney King, but that was because the governor actually in California asked George H.W. Bush to help and do this. This is unprecedented at this time to say, without a request, Without any request from any governor or anybody asking for the assistance or a militarized presence of these officers and of these um, military members on the streets to act unilaterally is shocking, especially given the fact that his motivation, it seems, he says initially, was about protecting on the one hand First Amendment rights, but on the other hand trying to encourage the, um, the Second Amendment rights, and he seemed to forget the five very important things here as you laid out. The First Amendment, the ability to have freedom of speech, you're actually taking people off of a public forum where they have every right to be to petition the government, assemble to be able to have the press present as well, and the final one, having religion. He seemed to have gotten that confused by going over to the church as those being all conflated into one principle. But all this goes to say that if you think you're disoriented now by seeing what's happening in your cities and towns in reaction to the killing of George Floyd and people at attempting in some ways to hijack the ideological protest for self-interested reasons, well, you're about to be very disoriented trying to figure out which country we're in, which amendments now apply, and whether the President of the United States can unilaterally say, I think I'll send in the military even if nobody asks me to. Jeffrey Tubin? Uh, legally, what what's your take? Well, uh, the the Insurrection Act itself is very clear that it, the the military can only come in at the request of the state, and that's what the governor's uh, governor J. B. Pritzker was referring to earlier, saying we don't want you. Now there are two other provisions that say the the military the the president can send in the military to vindicate constitutional rights. This is what uh, President Eisenhower used to send the troops into Little Rock to integrate the schools. But that's not what's going on here. There is no vindication of constitutional rights, federal court orders. So as I read the law, the president simply cannot do this without the invitation of the governors. So this seems to me yet another stunt where the president is acting as if he can do something, but in fact, he probably has no intention of doing it because the governors aren't gonna let him do it. General Honore, um, you know, the, you, you, you led forces in, in, in New Orleans and, and did a, a, an extraordinary job there. I'm wondering what you have just witnessed, what you make of the president using, you know, federal forces to clear a street in the nation's capital so he, and the defense secretary and others can stand in front of a closed down church for a photo op. 
Yeah, I thought I was watching a scene from uh, something in Turkey, uh, not in the United States. It's either the president don't understand the Constitution or he don't give a damn. Uh, this is a very disturbing. Uh, I must say this, though. Our troops must rest well in their families. He's given another order he cannot enforce. The suggestion will be that the Congress and the Senate need to come together and put some constraints on this president and the use of force as we move forward to the election. Our troops need to stand steady. The Congress and the Senate need to understand this man has control of over 3,000 nuclear weapons and thousands of jet planes and 11, 11 aircraft carriers and 2 million people in uniform. Uh, they need to put a check on what he said. He cannot execute what he said, but the American people need to have confidence and the Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense need to exercise their right not to go to photo ops like this. And the troops need to have confidence that the Joint Chiefs of Staff will follow the Constitution. There should be a lawyer from the Pentagon tomorrow morning filing a brief to the Senate and to the White House inappropriate use of the United States active duty. What they did with the National Guard is purely permissible. The National Guard of D.C. act at the direction of the Secretary of the Army based on the D.C. mayor. They were on federal ground. They could do what they did. Should they have done it? Probably not. But as long as they're on federal ground, that they can operate with the D.C. and the Secret Service to protect federal ground. They can bring federal troops in and put them on federal ground inside the White House if needed. Everyone, hold on. Uh, we've got someone on the phone that we want to hear from. Marianne Buddy, the Bishop of the District of Columbia, who oversees the church that the president just used as a photo op. Bishop Buddy, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being here. Uh, what are your thoughts as you as you saw what happened and as you look at these images now of, of so many Americans uh, crying out in the streets for law and order, law and order that is applied equally to all of us, uh, regardless of, of color, regardless of economic status? Um, I want to thank you for letting me be on this, uh, be part of this conversation. Let me be clear. Uh, the president just used a Bible, the most sacred text of the Judeo Christian tradition, and one of the churches of my diocese, without permission, as a backdrop for a message antithetical to the teachings of Jesus and everything that our churches stand for. And to do so, as you just said, he sanctioned the use of tear gas by police officers in riot gear to clear the churchyard. I am outraged. The president did not pray when he came to St. John's, nor, as you just articulated, did he acknowledge the agony of our country right now, and in particular, that of the people of color in our nation, who wonder if anyone ever, anyone in, in, in public power will ever acknowledge their sacred words, and who are rightfully demanding an end to 400 years of systemic racism and white supremacy in our country. And I just want the world to know that we in the Diocese of Washington, following Jesus and his way of love, do not we distance ourselves from the, from the incendiary language of this president. Uh, we follow someone who lived a life of nonviolence and sacrificial love. We align ourselves with those seeking justice for the death of George Floyd and countless others through the sacred act of peaceful protest. And I. <laughs> I just can't believe what my eyes have seen tonight. You had no idea he was going to do that. I had no idea. I was, I was watching the news with everyone else, and as you might imagine, I have been fielding out just phone calls and emails and texts of outrage from my people and from people across the country wondering what on earth did we just witness. Um, I. And I, 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 I hear everything else that has been said tonight, but I was allowed to eat off on the first part of your conversation, which is equally significant in terms of the symbolism of our civic institution. But what I am here to talk about is the, is the abuse of sacred symbols for the people of faith in this country to, to, to justify um, language rhetoric 
an approach to this crisis that is antithetical to everything we stand for, everything that the state stands for. You know, the, um, there were so many uh, religious leaders, uh, people from, from the faith community who took part in civil rights demonstrations, who were integral to, right. to the right. success of civil rights demonstrations, you know, year after year. Uh, there, there were faith leaders who, uh, not just Dr. King, but uh, members of different faith communities uh, who were killed on, uh, in, 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 in Mississippi you, and elsewhere. Yes. These are our heroes. These are our martyrs, right? Um, of, you know, mostly people of color, some beautiful white allies who are were privileged to stand with them. Um, these are the people that show us what it looks like to live and to walk a life of faith, right? That's what it looks like. Um, and um, that's the legacy. That's our hope. That's our only hope in this country. And. Um, and so much has, so much has been gained and so much has been lost in these last 40 years. And um, I feel that the soul of our nation is at stake right now. And we need moral leadership. And we also need, and that was, I think, what you all were talking about earlier. We need moral leadership. We also need political leadership. Because the people of faith in this country cannot, cannot act as a substitute for sound civic government and moral leadership and effective laws that are justly enforced for all people. And that is something that all people of faith, all people of goodwill, and all people who have no faith at all but believe in the civic principles of this country can agree. And in that public square we stand, um, and, and, and we, will, we must prevail as a people. Because what we're witnessing now is the, the shredding of our national fabric. If I could, uh, we got. I we, you know we have to, to go, but I just before we go, I, there's a lot of people watching right now who um, maybe they've been marching in the streets, maybe they have been staying at home, and maybe they're frightened about what they're seeing on the television and wondering where it's going and worried about their business, uh, you know, being destroyed or they're worried about their child who is out marching and you know is that is their child going to get killed is their child uh, going to get beaten up or uh, tear gassed and even during regular times there's a lot of people who you know worry about their children and themselves every single time they go outside and are they going to be arbitrarily pulled over what do, you say, I... what do you say to people tonight who are afraid well, I, um... well i'm afraid Right? I'm afraid. I'm afraid for my kids. I'm afraid for everyone's children. Um, I'm particularly mindful of the fact that those of us who are white have far less to be afraid of than people of color. But I, I fear for us. Fear, however, is not an excuse to, to um, stand idly by. Um, I do not, I, mean, I grieve the violence, the senseless violence and the destruction of livelihoods and the fabric of cities. I'm from Minneapolis and I'm watching what's happening there and I'm serving a city now that still bears the scars of what happened in the 60s. I understand the, the fear. Um, but I think if we don't look at the reasons, at the root causes of the cancerous in our nation, we will never get past the symptomatic eruptions and frankly the opportunistic um, distractions that keep us from our true self. And that's what we have to keep our eyes on and work toward while we find the wounds of those who become um, the, the, uh, the, 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 what's the word, the, 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 the collateral damage of a nation that will not face its sin, repent, and heal. I, correct me if I'm wrong, you worked in Minneapolis, what, for, was it 18 years? 18 years. My family, my, 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 I have family, I have friends, my, my son, my, my grandson. So, are, so as somebody who... As somebody who knows that city, I'm sorry to interrupt, but as somebody who knows that city, and, and I think it's such an important point to make, and, and you were alluding to this earlier, which is, you know, 
we're looking right now at, at you know, military on the street. We're looking at large numbers of, of people protesting in Los Angeles peacefully at this hour, thank goodness. Um, and we focus on these days a lot on demonstrations because that is what is happening in the streets right now and what our political leaders are talking about, uh, for better or for worse. Um, it, it threatens to uh, make us focus on just on protests and not on the underlying reasons why people feel driven into these exactly. streets and the, exactly. not just the murder and and i use that word murder uh intentionally of 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 mr floyd um but but the 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 lack of law and order applied equally to all citizens for not just you know individuals but for community entire communities of color uh black and brown and not just for this year or last year, but for decades and decades, and frankly, hundreds of years. Well, you said it as, as articulately as anyone would hope to. I mean, that is the deep-seated, decades-long injustices um, and embedded systemic racism and the, um, and the inability to hold um, officers accountable for their crimes. I mean, these go back. This is, this is embedded in the police force in cities like Minneapolis. And the, um, the racial injustices go back, as you know, they go back to policies and practices <coughs> that were um, the direct roots of slavery and antebellum and Jim Crow. I mean, all of those things, we can look at all of those things. I mean, we're, this is June 1st, for crying out loud. We know what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 100, uh, almost 100 years ago, when an entire, when an entire community of African African Americans were basically massacred, right? And their and their and their communities destroyed by angry white vigilantes, right? All of that is part of our history. And one of the responsibilities of people of faith is to know the context in which superficial acts. When I say superficial, I don't mean insignificant, but the ones that are right on the surface, right? We need to understand the deep rooted causes of these things, not to justify individual acts of violence. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if we don't understand the context, we miss the opportunity to be agents of healing. Mm. And, um, and that's what we heard in our president tonight. We miss yeah. one opportunity after another, after another, after another. Yeah. And, well, um, it is. I, I love that phrase, how to be agents of healing. I think that's something that uh, we should all reflect on uh, in the hours and the days ahead of how to, how to be that in, in our own lives and our own communities. Bishop Buddy, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just ahead, we're going to talk with Magic Johnson about what we have just seen uh, and what is happening uh, in his town and his country and our country. We'll be right back. When, when you have a man that's handcuffed with four police officers, uh, it was just inhumane. It was criminal. Uh, and uh, my heart goes out to uh, the Floyd family. My heart goes out to everyone who sees and what happened to him sees their own family and their own family member. We had an 80 year old woman here murdered, little old lady, two, two or three weeks ago, uh, exiting the Walgreens. And I saw my mother's face. And if people don't understand the anger, for the black community, when they see uh, George Floyd's face, they see their brother, their sister, their son, their uncle, their cousin. And so we all need to take a step back, breathe, and remember our humanity. And we're supposed to be a Judeo-Christian society. And we need to start lifting up each other in prayer. We're really going to move this country uh, where it needs to be. Uh, Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo, uh, thank you so much for taking some time tonight on what I'm sure is a busy night. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Be safe. I had the uh, unsettling and violent scenes that play out this weekend at some police, as some police outfitted for war confronted protesters. The militarization of the police and equipment and mentality after this. And we have been doing that both at the testing centers as well as on Skid Row and with people experiencing homelessness and in now all of our senior skilled nursing facilities. Finally, we've handed out nearly $20 million in cash assistance through Angelino cards. We've also had business ambassadors who are working hard and through what we saw the unrest to be able to